October 31st, the annual gathering of ghosts and goblins, when witches ride through the clouds on broomsticks, when black cats roam abroad, when the dead come forth from their graves and cast aside their shrouds and dance in observance of All Saints Day, or as it is commonly known, Halloween. <laughs> Hi, this is Mike from Blue Island Public Library. The city of Blue Island has a long history of celebrating Halloween, and the recent digitizing of the Blue Island Sun Standard newspaper has made this apparent. Today we're going to be focusing on some Blue Island Halloween-related newspaper clippings from the early 1900s, including local parties, fundraisers, activities, advertising, and, of course, some scary stories. The Sun Standard had a recurring section in each article called All Around Town, and later Blue Island Locals that detail local happenings or, as it was described, some short items about your own and the doing of your friends. These were things like birthdays, picnic parties, births and deaths, people coming in from out of town, people going out of town, local police events, city ordinances, and, you guessed it, Halloween parties. There was no shortage of Halloween parties in Blue Island. There were parties everywhere, parties on Greenwood, Gregory, Grove Street, High Street, Maple Street, New Street, Olive Street, Walnut Street, Western Avenue. You name it, there was probably a Halloween party on that street at some point in time. And it wasn't just residential homes. Many businesses and groups had Halloween events, such as this one from the Blue Island Eagles, or this one at the Greenwood School Gym, or this one from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. The first Lutheran Young People's Club had several Halloween parties, some of them to set had at least 100 people. Other venues and groups include St. Aidan's Sunday School, Lincoln School, the Tecumseh Camp Fire Girls, the Cuckoo Club, the Tennis Club, the Women's Relief Corps, and the list goes on. Halloween also had its expected effects on local businesses like the selling of Halloween themed items, such as this advertisement for Halloween novelties, or this one for Halloween party favors and decorations. There were also food specials like this one for pumpkin vanilla ice cream, or this Halloween special for orange pineapple in New York ice cream. These were being sold for about 50 cents, about six, seven dollars in today's money. Canned pumpkin, on the other hand, would cost you about 15 cents a can, or 25 cents for two. I didn't actually find anything on the Lyric Theater other than the occasional ghost movie or play, like this showing of the Midnight Bell which was a silent movie that is now lost. Some other businesses had their events for the purpose of fundraising, such as these ones from the Blue Island Retail Food Dealers Association and Blue Island Basketball Team, each charging 50 cents admission. The Garfield PTA raised $60 in 1919, or somewhere around $800 in today's money. Here's another one from nearby Mount Greenwood raising a similar amount. Now you're probably wondering, what exactly did they do at these Halloween parties 100 years ago? Well, it seems like most of what you would expect. Costume and masquerade parties were very common, some of which included prizes for best costumes. The traditional apple bobbing made its appearance. Sometimes it was just an excuse to get together with friends, or it was tied in with a birthday party or other event. Other Halloween party events included the roasting of marshmallows and the telling of ghost stories. It was good old-fashioned fun, at least most of the time. The city did have its fair share of troublemakers from time to time. One year, when Halloween fell on a Saturday, it prompted this notice that extra plainclothes officers would be on the lookout for anyone destroying or defacing property. One person even complained, Halloween is celebrated longer each year. Here's another police notice from 1924 titled, Be careful what pranks you play Halloween night, which I could barely make out, but I believe it says that any boy or girl caught marking up store windows or automobiles with grease, chalk, or paint will be severely punished and that parents will be held responsible as well. It even notes that in the previous year, several boys had to wash all the windows on Western Avenue while police stood guard because they were caught greasing one window, which is a far cry from roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. Speaking of ghost stories, Blue Island and its neighbors had a few of their own. Let's start with a non-scary story like the start of the Cedar Park Cemetery near neighboring Calumet Park. In July 1923, a mysterious body was found buried in a field in a lonely grave not far from the corner of Halstead and Vermont Street. <clears throat> it was then called the village of Burr Oak. Nobody could figure out why it was there, 
even calling it a great murder mystery. So the Blue Island Police and other authorities called in a shovel brigade to come in and dig everything up. They found that the body had been autopsied and had a dated foot tag stating that it was an unidentified white man found in a river in Chicago. Everyone thought the undertaking firm just made a mistake because it was commonly thought that there was going to be a new cemetery, but that it was going to be west of 126th and Racine, at least a half a mile away. It turns out that it was all just a misunderstanding when, quote, a deputy coroner learned that officials of a new cemetery called Cedar Park wanted to start burials in the cemetery to make it such. In the end, they ended up putting the remains back in the original grave and making Cedar Park Cemetery an actual cemetery, at least by definition, once again. Then there were all the stories about the Calumet Sag Channel. In 1920, a string of bodies were found earning nicknames like the Death Canal and Death Valley. It started at first when a Mexican man was found at the Gregory Street Bridge when it was reported he was shot through the heart. The next week, two boys were fishing when one of them saw what he thought was a black post floating down the river, but it was actually a floating corpse wearing a heavy coat and cap. A few weeks later, another body of a Chicago man was found, which was later ruled to be a suicide. All these murder mysteries prompted one frightened reporter to write such things as, we don't believe in ghosts except when alone in the dark, and we are in no hurry to go strolling by the sanitary canal. We prefer our murder news where it belongs, in the newspaper. And finally, the local canal zone is a good place to keep away from when the moon is behind a cloud. It probably didn't help that several months later, a headless skeleton was found at the bottom of the canal held by a heavy weight. What made this even more chilling is that two weeks later, the Sun Standard received an anonymous letter with a drawing of a skull and a dagger threatening death to anyone who printed anything more about the skeleton mystery. The Death Canal seemed to be appropriately named. Finally, there were the stories of the infamous black-garbed phantom, aka the Woman of Mystery, in Blue Island around 1919. As the story goes, tales of a mysterious woman were first prevalent in Harvey and Roseland before coming to Blue Island, as a ghostly woman appearing each night on the Illinois Central Railroad track, which is now the Metro Electric. She was said to have a horse's hoof and a silver army, and eventually started appearing in all parts of Blue Island instead of just the railroad tracks. One story of the Phantom detailed terrifying a group of Italians who responded by shooting at the ghost to no effect. Another story involves a man nearby Riverdale seeing a woman in black rise suddenly before his machine and that he was so unnerved he lost control and landed in a ditch. Other stories include the Phantom floating over sewers and scaring people. So, what happened to the Phantom? Well, one story says that she was at one point captured by Blue Island police, but then turned into a dog. Another story says the Phantom was actually a mentally deranged woman who was captured by the Mount Greenwood police, but this was later denied when they said they had no such woman in their jail. Still another story says that the Phantom was impersonated by a Harvey woman who was then arrested by Harvey police and ordered out of town, thus ending the sightings. I guess we'll never know. So there you have it. A little bit about Blue Island's Halloween history early in the 1900s. For more information, check out the library's website, blueislandlibrary.org, where the Blue Island Sun Standard has recently been digitized all the way back to 1913. See you next time.